There is a famous saying, what Bengal thinks today, India thinks tomorrow. While this might be debatable today, Bangladeshi students have taken the lead in protesting against the quota system in government jobs, outpacing their Indian counterparts. Islam is an egalitarian religion where before Allah, everyone is equal. However, in Muslim-majority Bangladesh, there appears to be a division among citizens. Those who are descendants of freedom fighters are often seen as upper class, while the rest are considered lower class. This perception is reinforced by the special preference given to freedom fighters' descendants in government jobs. Over time, this has created a privileged class based on blood and lineage. Currently, almost 56% of government job quotas in Bangladesh are reserved for special categories. Among these, a significant 30% is allocated to the family members and relatives of freedom fighters who fought for Bangladesh's liberation in 1971. This means that descendants of these freedom fighters receive a substantial advantage, allowing them to bypass the competitive process faced by other candidates. The remaining quotas include 10% for women, 10% for inhabitants of underdeveloped districts, 5% for ethnic minorities, and 1% for disabled people. Interestingly, descendants of freedom fighters can also compete in these other quotas if they qualify as women, residents of underdeveloped districts, ethnic minorities, or disabled individuals. Understanding why Bangladesh is experiencing intense protests against this quota system is crucial, not only for Bangladesh, but also for neighboring countries like India and Pakistan, where similar reservation systems exist. Let's examine the 30% quota for descendants of freedom fighters. After the Bangladeshi Liberation War, the decision to allocate a substantial 30% quota for these descendants was driven by national, emotional, and ethical considerations aiming to ensure better lives for the families of those who had sacrificed so much. During that war, between 300,000 and 3 million Bangladeshi people were killed by Pakistani forces, with the assistance of pro-Pakistani local militias known as Razakars. Additionally, between 200,000 and 400,000 Bangladeshi women were subjected to rape. Today, students protesting against this 30% quota are being labeled as Razakars, a term from 50 years ago that directly translates to traitors. However, branding students who demand fair competition in government jobs as traitors is unjust. These students are, in fact, ahead of their South Asian counterparts and people from other nations who passively accept imposed reservation systems without evidence of their effectiveness. The reality is that quotas and reservations intended to uplift oppressed and underprivileged communities often fail to achieve their goals even over extended periods. There is no substantial evidence suggesting that they are effective. Instead, these quotas often elevate ineligible individuals to government positions, hindering progress and frustrating the truly deserving candidates. It is essential to acknowledge that Bangladesh is one of the poorest countries in the world, as measured by per capita income. With a population nearing 170 million, more than 30 million Bangladeshi youth are unemployed, Despite the country experiencing nearly 6% economic growth and a significant rise in private sectors and industries, the minimum monthly salary is less than $120, which is insufficient for a decent living. As in many third world countries, government jobs in Bangladesh are highly sought after due to their stability and lucrative nature. However, a critical point often overlooked by the media is that these jobs are desirable not only for financial security, but also for the potential to become wealthy quickly through bribery and corruption. Corruption is pervasive at all levels of government in Bangladesh, making it the 12th most corrupt country globally and the second most corrupt in South Asia. When individuals compete for government jobs, they often consider the additional income they can generate through bribes. The higher the position, the greater the opportunities for bribery, which is not perceived as a severe crime due to its widespread acceptance in society. This rampant corruption is a significant reason for the current unrest in Bangladesh. Protesters have witnessed how quickly government job holders amass wealth disproportionate to their official incomes, leading to frustration and anger. Eligible students who have studied diligently for years feel humiliated when they see ineligible individuals obtaining these lucrative positions and improving their financial status rapidly. On the other hand, descendants of freedom fighters are enraged that protesters are obstructing their path to financial prosperity. It is noteworthy that since the Bangladeshi Liberation War was led by the current ruling party, the Awami League, 
Many freedom fighters and their descendants are active political cadres of this party. Consequently, with government support, they are violently interfering with student protests, using rods and bricks to suppress dissent. Thus, this protest symbolizes a clash between the privileged descendants of freedom fighters, who are benefiting from government favoritism, and the remaining students, who feel marginalized and powerless. Now let's discuss the descendants of freedom fighters, who are predominantly third generation. In the government's eyes, these individuals are more eligible simply because they possess the blood of freedom fighters, exempting them from competing like other students. This policy has elevated them to a status superior to others. Regardless of whether they are descendants from son or daughter of freedom fighters, they are deemed superior. Even if they marry actual descendants of the pro-Pakistani militias known as Razakars, they are considered superior. Their status remains unaffected even if they seek to leave Bangladesh for green cards or passports of developed Western countries like the USA. Despite having low merit, they are prioritized over those with higher merits who have worked hard and studied diligently. Even if they engage in activities that betray their country and nationality, they are still considered superior. This special privilege of reduced competition is granted to them despite the fact that they did not personally fight for Bangladesh's independence from Pakistan. This raises a pertinent question. If descendants of freedom fighters are deemed so important, what about the descendants of those who fought against the British to liberate Bharat, which included India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh? These earlier freedom fighters are arguably more significant since they planted the seeds of freedom on the subcontinent, eventually leading to the separation from India in the name of Islam in 1947 and then from Pakistan in 1971 through the Bengali ethnic movement that liberated Bangladesh. These earlier freedom fighters are equally, if not more, important, but are not granted such privileges, highlighting the politics of vote manipulation. Quotas are allocated not rationally, but based on the potential number of votes the ruling party can secure. Moreover, since 30% of government jobs are effectively reserved for the Awami League's cadres, under the guise of being descendants of freedom fighters, it becomes easier to perpetuate widespread, systematic, and uncriticized corruption within government offices. This quota system also facilitates election rigging, as opposition parties and independent commentators frequently claim that recent elections were unfair, with anti-ruling party activists being oppressed and media restrictions imposed. Thus, this 30% quota system paves the way for generational corruption. Another critical issue is the accuracy of identifying freedom fighters, which may itself be questionable. Good people often do not boast about their achievements, while those with less honorable intentions may present themselves as virtuous. There is a significant possibility that mistakes were made in recognizing freedom fighters after the successful completion of the Bangladesh Liberation War. Many individuals who were not involved in the war might have falsely registered themselves as freedom fighters. Conversely, some genuine freedom fighters, who were modest and did not seek recognition, may not have been included on the official list. As a result, many of their descendants could be among the students protesting today. Furthermore, silent Razakars or traitors might have strategically married recognized freedom fighters to enhance their chances of securing government jobs, especially when private employment opportunities were scarce. Over three generations, it is likely that the bloodlines of many freedom fighters have intermingled with those of Razakars, diluting the original intent behind the quota. Additionally, it is questionable why the third generation of freedom fighters continues to receive preferential treatment for government jobs, even when they are ineligible. These descendants often do not study or work as hard to secure employment because they face significantly less competition than others. It is important to consider the consequences of quotas. Bangladeshi employees chosen based on merit are generally more effective than those who secure jobs through quotas. Merit-based employees tend to bring innovative ideas and higher productivity, ultimately benefiting the entire country by creating more jobs for the larger population. For example, proponents of a free market with exceptional negotiating skills in top government positions can implement laws that stimulate economic growth create job opportunities, and improve living standards, thus enriching the country. On the other hand, ineligible employees who secure positions through quotas may lack such vision and instead focus on exploiting the system and perpetuating corruption within the bureaucracy. In the long run, 
quotas can inadvertently impoverish the targeted groups or communities instead of enriching them. How can quotas make people wealthy when the jobs they secure offer only $120 to $250 in monthly salary? Many people in Bangladesh aspire to leave these positions for better opportunities, such as obtaining permanent residency or passports in developed Western countries like the United States. In conclusion, this protest is crucial not only for Bangladesh but also for its South Asian neighbors, like India and Pakistan. If the protest is successful, it may inspire angry Indians and Pakistanis to protest against the discriminatory quota systems in their own countries. This movement could send a powerful message to the entire world that ineffective and discriminatory quota systems can and should be abolished altogether.